Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. Kevin sent me notes and Steve, check this out. It's an update to something you've covered in previous videos. And this is one of those cases that apparently will just never go away. Kind of like something in the story. Um, here's the opinion written by the U.S. Court of Appeals, the Eighth Circuit. And the opinion was handed down and filed just yesterday. And this is the case involving Geico and the man and the woman who are in a car doing things that people often do behind closed doors. And I guess technically there are doors on cars, so, you know. Uh, <laughs> but you'll recall the case is known by its initials, Geico versus M.O. and M.B. Uh, and that's the case where M.B. gave M.O. Uh, the gift that keeps on giving, and by that I mean a, a, a kind of sickness that you can catch, uh, and they did that in a car. Then the woman, M.O., went after M.B., uh, for damages, saying, hey, um, uh, you owe me money. And since you were uh, with me in that car of yours and the car has insurance, the insurance company should pay. And the story made headlines because originally uh, somebody had ruled against Geico. And, of course, Geico said that was not fair. And so it's kind of complicated, but I'm going to do this the best I can to keep this as a G-rated channel. But uh, MB and MO had an ongoing adult relationship that included at least one encounter in uh, MB's car. A year after that encounter, MO was diagnosed with something uh, that, that you wouldn't want to have. MO threatened to sue MB, alleging that he had negligently failed to inform her that he was infected or to take adequate steps to prevent her from contracting what she got. She also sent a demand letter to Geico requesting that it pay her a million dollars, the policy limit under the man's Kansas Family Automobile Insurance Policy with Geico, to settle her claim against him. Geico denied the demand and filed a deck action, which is a declaratory judgment action, against the man and the woman in the U.S. District Court for the District of Kansas, seeking a declaration that the policy did not cover the injuries. And a deck action is something you hear about from time to time, especially with insurance coverage. So somebody will file a lawsuit, and they'll often name somebody. They'll go, that's the defendant. But, of course, they're insured. So the insurance company gets dragged into it also. And so quite often, the insurance company very, very early on will file a motion and say, I want a ruling from the court that this policy that, that I represent does not cover that. Because if it doesn't cover that, we're out. Because remember that an uh, insurance policy often includes a duty to defend to defend the lawsuit. So they may have to defend the lawsuit, even if they don't have any coverage. That wouldn't make any sense. So meanwhile, the two of them, MB and MO, settled the threatened lawsuit pursuant to arbitration, which apparently is allowed in Missouri. And an agreement under that statute expressly authorizes an insured to settle a personal injury or wrongful death action by agreeing that the plaintiff may collect a settlement only against the insurer. However, there's some issues about that as well. But the arbitrator did award $5.2 million to the woman who then sought uh, and tried to get that uh, award confirmed in state court. And that's when Geico appealed, and this whole mess went back and forth for quite some time. A lot of technicalities here. But meanwhile, meanwhile, um, this court is now going to look at the whole thing because that's where we are. So they're looking at a grant of summary judgment on an insurance policy. And the question is, does this policy cover those injuries that occurred in a car in this manner? And it all boils down to, and I tell people all, all the time, that insurance policies are governed by a contract. There's usually a written contract that governs them. And you simply look at the contract to see what it says. So the two parties here, argue that the plain language of the policy either clearly covers the disease acquired through activity or is sufficiently ambiguous that we should construe the policy in favor of coverage. And keep in mind that if you draft a contract that you get me to sign, if there's ambiguities in there, many state courts will construe the ambiguities against the drafting party so that it encourages the drafting party to get their act together. So here, the, the policy says that Geico will pay damages 
which an insured becomes legally obligated to pay because of, one, bodily injury sustained, sustained by a person, and, two, damage to or destruction of property arising out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of the owned auto or a non-owned auto. Okay? The two parties here, the man and the woman, read the sentence to mean that Geico will pay damages that the man is legally obligated to pay because of bodily injury sustained by a person. And two, damages that the man is legally obligated to pay because of damages to or destruction of property arising out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of the owned auto or non-owned auto. To support this interpretation, both of them point to the line break and the semicolon between the bodily injury and property damage provisions. They start talking about punctuation. Under the punctuation and last antecedent canons of construction, placement of punctuation is presumed to have meaning. And referential and qualifying words and phrases, where no contra intention appears, refer solely to the last antecedent. <laughs> Both canons support the two people's interpretation that the arising out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of the owned auto or non-owned auto qualifier applies only to the property clause, not the bodily injury clause. Thus, on their reading, the policy does not require covered bodily injury to arise out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of the vehicle. Okay? And so, I, I know it's kind of complicated without the language in front of you, but it says, Geico will pay bodily injury sustained by person and damage to or destruction of property arising out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of the owned auto or non-owned auto. They're saying that the bodily injury sustained by a person should not be limited to arising out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of the owned auto or non-owned auto. They're saying it just should apply to bodily injury sustained by a person. Boom. And I can kind of see the argument, but this is one of those things where you can actually step back, and I agree with what the court did here. They said, under Kansas law, we determine the intention of the parties to an insurance policy by considering what a reasonable person in the position of the insured would understand the policy to mean. And remember that the insurance company drafted the policy. So the question is, what would the insured read from it? And so they do hold this to a reasonable person standard. When interpreting a contract or statute, we derive meaning not just from abstract words in isolation, but from their context and from the document as a whole. And so they take a look at the entire contract and what it says. The Supreme Court of the United States has addressed this very, very similar issue, uh, and they go into that quite a bit. But it says here, when we review the policy at issue through the lens of what a reasonable person in the position of the insured would understand the policy to mean, we conclude that the arising out of clause unambiguously modifies both the bodily injury and the property damage clauses. Okay? As in prior cases, the two people here are offering an interpretation of the sentence that would result in an unnatural reading of the policy. The series qualifier canon, which generally reflects the most natural reading of the sentence, suggests that the arising out of language applies to bodily injury. Imagine if a teacher announced that students must not complete or check any homework to be turned in for grade using online homework help websites. It'd be strange to read that rules prohibiting students from completing homework altogether with or without online support. So I know some of this stuff might be hard to comprehend just listening to it, but the point is that that sort of strange argument is exactly what these two are urging the court to adopt here, and they ain't going to do it. This argument is similarly unavailing, nonsensically suggesting that the policy requires an automobile to be present at the scene of but otherwise wholly unrelated to a suffered bodily injury. <laughs> and that's the point, is that you get injured because of the use or maintenance or ownership of an owned auto or a non-owned auto, which would be covered by the same policy, that it would have to have something to do with that and to suggest that it also covers bodily injury sustained by a person that does not arise out of the ownership, maintenance, or use, uh, does get you kind of an absurd result. So the two of them alternatively argue that her injuries are covered under the policy because they, in fact, arose out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of the owned auto. Their argument relies heavily on a case 
in which the Supreme Court of Kansas held that a leg injury caused by the accidental firing of a shotgun as it was taken from an automobile during a hunting trip arose out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of a motor vehicle. They point out that that case holds that for insurance coverage to exist for accidental bodily injury, there's no requirement that the vehicle be either the proximate cause of the injury or physically contribute to the immediate cause of the injury. Coverage exists where the minimal causal connection between the use of the vehicle and the injury is provided by the foreseeable and reasonable use of the vehicle. These two argue that adult activity in an automobile is just as foreseeable and reasonable as using an automobile for a hunting trip. Yet, that other case reiterates that Kansas follows the majority rule that there must be some causal connection between the use of the insured vehicle and the injury. Merely because a motor vehicle is the site of an injury, I believe they use the Latin situs, does not mean that the injury necessarily arises out of the use of the motor vehicle. Got it? So the injury happened there, but did it arise out of the use of the motor vehicle? As stated in another case, the ownership, use, or maintenance of the vehicle must have a greater nexus to the injury than just relating to a party being the wrong place at the wrong time. So you can think of all kinds of examples, like what if they had stepped out of the vehicle and were doing something back by the trunk of the car, or the hood, or up against, you know those kinds of things? Again, G-rated, we gotta, we got to stop where we're going with that. But you understand the point. The fact that the car is there doesn't mean that the car is so closely related to what's happening there that the coverage would occur. So the prior case, the Hunters, distinguished other cases on the grounds that the automobile and garrison, the hunting case, was more than the situs of the injury because it was being used to transport the hunters and their guns when the accident occurred, the engine was running, and the plaintiff was driving and had intended to drive farther. Unlike that case, the record does not reflect that at the time that the woman here got injured that the automobile was being used to transport anyone was being driven or the engine was running. I'm so glad. I, I, <laughs> I mean, you hear stories, okay? <laughs> but presumably the car was stopped with the engine not running. And we, 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 we hope, right? So they point out that generally the burden is on the insured to prove that a loss falls within the scope of an insurance policy. Even if we assume that using an automobile as a shelter counts as use for the meaning of the insurance policy, such use cannot be so remote from the negligent act then he said there was no causal relationship between the use of the car and the injuries sustained. The negligent act here was the man failing to tell the woman that he had this disease or to take steps to prevent its transmission. The most relevant analogy is thus not to garrison the case about the hunter, but to Evans, in which the use of a vehicle as a shelter in the rain to light a firecracker which subsequently injured another, was not covered under the policy because one just as easily could have held the device under the car or stood on the leeward side of it to light the device. Kind of like what I said as an adult act could have been held under the car, depending on the ground clearance, or on the leeward side of the, uh, uh, of the car. <laughs> so no causal relationship exists between the two people here and their decision to shelter in an automobile for an adult encounter, as opposed to choosing to shelter in a house or no shelter at all. And the transmission of the disease, no. So the man's automobile is nothing more than the situs of her injury. Thus, it cannot be said that his negligent transmission uh, arose out of the use of the automobile. So the insurance policy unambiguously covers only bodily injury, arising out of the ownership, maintenance, or use of the automobile because the injuries did not arise out of the use of the automobile, the district court did not err in granting summary judgment to GEICO. So they affirm this. That's the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, I'm, I glossed over the tortured history of this case, and that's only because I remember that they had sent a demand letter, then they had arbitrated then they got the arbitration confirmed by a court, but then Geico filed an action to get that undone, and that wound up in federal court, and now they're working their way through the federal system. So arguably, this case could be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. We'd see what would happen if they did, but I don't know if they'd take it up. I highly doubt it, but I've been wrong before. However, this appears to be the end of it. 
However, I think I've said that also previously. So, <laughs> like I said, the opinion came down just yesterday. And uh, again, that's M-O and M-B uh, as defendants, appellants, and Geico is the plaintiff appellee. And as of right now, Geico is off the hook for the injuries that the woman is claiming that she got in the car. No one's doubting that she got those, got that injury in the car. But of course, it's a question whether you have insurance coverage for that. And as of right now, the courts have said no. There you go. Kevin, thanks for sending it. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. I'm just one stomach flu away from my goal weight.